Hey, hey, welcome back to The Broker's Voice. I am super excited today because when I get to meet somebody who is very much in alignment with the way I think and, and some of my beliefs around the mental game uh, when it comes to business, I want to have this person on the podcast. Uh, I call it the podcast, but The Broker's Voice is more a show. So I'm excited. I've got Jamie Reed, one of the founding partners of C3 uh, Insurance in San Diego. Jamie, welcome aboard. Thanks for having me, Andy. Excited to be here. All right, Jamie. So we're going to get into some really interesting stuff in this pod. I keep saying podcast. I've, I just recorded one of my other episodes um, in this show today because, man, you've had one heck of a journey in the last week, which we're going to talk about. But before we get there, most of us did not get in this industry by design. I'm curious to know, how did you find yourself in the insurance industry? That's so funny. I th when you talk about how similar we are, because I say that all the time that in sixth grade, nobody wrote, they want to be ins insurance, anything, you know, um, on their, what do they want to be when they grow up uh, cards? And so I, I got in, in a way that I got to be careful because I, I tend to make fun of myself and our industry. So I don't intend to do that, but um, I, I went to college for safety, like hard hats and safety glasses. And, um, and I went there because in uh, 1999, when I graduated, it was the quickest, easiest degree to get. First of all, like I could go have fun at college and I wasn't doing computer science, science or political classes. You know, it was just pretty easy to get a safety degree. And uh, and two, it paid the highest starting wages. So you could pay not a lot for your college. It was easy to get. And it had a high uh, comp right out of college. And I was fortunate enough to go work for a company that was really, really good in the construction industry and Black and & Veatch and Burns and & Mac. And we self-insured programs. And all my counterparts who were safety people, they went into the insurance industry. You know, it's, it's an easy job ver versus working directly for a big contractor. And they've been recruiting me over for years. And I finally just got to the place where I was like, all right, I, I don't want to be traveling seven days a week. You know, I want to have a family someday and in insurance, it was possible to do that. So uh, I stepped into the insurance company side of things. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I agree. I, just the fact you went to college for safety, though it was more on the construction side, puts you closer than most people who get into the insurance industry. One of the reasons I wanted to have you on today is just in our conversations we've had offline, I love your perspective on the mental game of, of business, of selling, and what it takes up here to have success selling insurance. And you know, one of those things is overcoming a lot of fear. We talk, uh, you're going to talk about imposter syndrome and things like that. And some of the rituals and habits you deploy into your life to make sure you're having success on the field. But uh, the thing I'd love for you to talk about, man, is just a week ago, we're recording this on Monday, June 5th, just a week ago, you were in Kiev, Ukraine, in the middle of a war, meeting with delegates in the, in the national capital, where you were surrounded by bombs and missiles. Talk about that experience. I mean, just hearing it offline blew me away. Well, it it, uh, it, it was mind blowing. It was mind blowing for me. And sometimes I I had imposter syndrome just being there, right? It's, it's like, how or why do I even deserve an opportunity to be in the room with some of the people that were there, some of the brightest military and political minds, business minds on earth. And uh, so just being there uh, was surreal. And, but from a, from a fear perspective, and, and, I, and Jamie, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Set the stage. Why were you there in the first place? Let's talk about that. How did you end up getting the opportunity to go over to Ukraine? I want to make sure the listeners hear that. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I, I thought about that a lot. I'm, I'm involved with a group called Alder and I think, I think ultimately the reason I ended up in Ukraine is because I said, yes, you know, and to, a, to a lot of things in life, you know, it's just, saying yes getting out of a comfort zone created the opportunity to then to eventually be in ukraine so i said yes to a group called alder um alder is a, a group that's focused on creating generational leadership because at, at a fundamental level we we believe that the way political leaders develop and progress through their careers in the united states is is broken not, not picking a side, just, you know, you, you almost have to become a career politician these days to, to rise through the rank and become 
uh, someone of significance. And so Older at a, at a Premise has uh, this mission to influence the next generation of leaders who are committed to leaving the world a better place. So it's sort of YPO qualified people, um, but it's not for doing business. It's people who generally want to do things for the world. And two of the members, one of them runs a company called Concentric Advisors. And Concentric Advisors is pretty much a company that moves, you know, any president of the United States, when they move around the world, they handle the logistics and safety of that. So he's a member in, in our organization. And then another gentleman um, runs a family practice and splits time living in Ukraine, has a Ukrainian wife. So when the war started, he moved there and just as a volunteer was trying to figure out any way to help the Ukrainian people um, on whatever level it may be. The the two, uh, I'll, I'll try to answer your question because there ends up being an insurance reason I, I was there that I didn't know why uh, I would even be there. But the, the one around fear was there really, I think there was fear about my wife and other people. Um, I really didn't know what to expect when I got there, but there was really no fear because we, the very first day we spent the whole day touring the country and interacting with people. And it was like, no Ukrainian is afraid. Like they are a hundred percent like fearless and convicted to a cause. Um, and I would say the word was like at peace, like even though it's war, they were at peace with what they were there to do. Um, so that like transitions into you to where I, I felt peaceful despite some of the chaos that was going on. That's interesting because it made me think of, you know, you hear the stories back from World War II when like the Germans were bombing England and things like that and bombings were happening every single day. And the 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 English were just almost at peace. It was like they were just this tight community that, oh, there goes the sirens again. Let's go to the yep. bomb shelter and just rinse yep. and repeat, right? And it's it, to put yourself in that situation when, quite frankly, you don't have to, right? You don't have to go over there. Um, you know, we talk about putting yourself, success requires you to put yourself in uncomfortable situations. Um, that would be near the top of uncomfortable situations right now in this, especially as uh, things unfold in this world. Talk about for a minute just what that experience was like, because when you were talking or telling me offline, I mean, you were telling me how close bombs and missiles were going off. I mean, that had to be quite an eye opening experience. Yeah. So what what happened was or or is happening is that now that the West is supporting Ukraine, they for the first time really have weaponry to do something with. So they've been preparing and mounting a, a counter assault against Russia. So instead of just defending a position, they're looking to take the fight to Russia. And Russia knows this. They they understand that the West is bringing in artillery and whatnot. So up until the week that we got there, bombs and things, I was told, really aren't going off in Kyiv anymore. You know, they had they had a big battle there and and the Ukrainians held them, held them out and turned them away. And then it had been fairly quiet. Then the week we get there, you know, Putin gets some intel that this mounting effort is coming and he starts sending a combination of Iranian drones that are gravity fed bombs uh, to the center of Kyiv. And then at the same time, he may be shooting hypersonic missiles coming in. And you and I talked about a story on the last night that I'd already gone to the bomb shelter a time or two. And I'd average about two nights or two hours a night sleep uh, because of these raids and sirens and everything going off. I think it was just pure exhaustion. I didn't wake up for it. Uh, I didn't hear the sirens. I didn't hear my app go off. The first I heard of it was the bombs exploding outside of our, our hotel, which were Patriot missiles launching. And when they launch, they, you know, everything's shaking and rattles the hotel and stuff. And then they intercept a hypersonic missile um, that was close enough that the loud, the sound was loud. And, you know, you could go tomorrow, I'll put it on my LinkedIn. I put it on my other social media. Uh, so tomorrow being Tuesday, six, six, uh, I'll, I'll put it on LinkedIn and it doesn't do it justice um, to hear it like on your cell phone or computer. But I was showing my daughter in my car, you know, a surround sound and everything. And you could feel the vibration of it in the car. It, it kind of reminded me of it, you know, when you're in the hotel. Wow. What would you say, you know, I didn't intend to go here with today's show, but 
you telling me these stories, I'm like, people have to hear this. In your days you've spent there, coming back to the States here, what would you say has been one of your biggest takeaways from your time in the Ukraine? Uh, I'll go to the thing I was going to reference earlier. I didn't know why I was there. Uh, you know, I said yes because of curiosity and wanting to gain perspective. I've, I've, you know, I've heard in the news, you know, CNN and Fox News, which, whichever you consume, they're really opinion networks, right? They, they're talking about the news, but they're casting an opinion on whatever the news is. And so I don't really consume that way. But I've heard propaganda on both sides, and it's really hard to filter through what it was. So. When our group put this opportunity together, I'm like, I, I just want to go. I want to see it, experience it, live it, and feel it from that perspective. And then we're sitting in a group of meetings called the Cypher Brief, which is intended to bring unfiltered real news direct to people. And so we're hearing from General Petraeus and different people of that level, different people in the Ukrainian you know, heads of uh, ministry and cabinet members that report to Zelensky are there explaining things to us about what's happening. And at the same time, there was an economic part of it because, you know, Ukraine not only has to beat Russia, fend them off, but then they've got to stand up an economy that's been decimated because of the war. And that's a huge challenge. And so there, there are Ukrainian companies that are there trying to pitch uh, bringing money into the, that country, yet there's there's a wartime exclusion on every insurance policy. So the the private equity firms and those people that were there, it comes up. Is there a way to solve this insurance problem? And I'm like, oh, maybe that's why I'm here. You know, I'm like, I don't actually know how to solve that problem, but it it feels similar, like a cousin to the terrorism coverage that was created out of 9/11. So I'm like, now I'm on a mission to try to figure out who created that, how it worked, what is there uh, something that we could bring to Ukraine so that foreign investment ha can get to a level of comfort that they'll help the economy recover and, and provide a product to them. So that was kind of a takeaway for me. It was like, oh, even though I couldn't see it, like just intuition, I guess, there was purpose. You know, it's a good segue into talking about your perspectives on our industry, because I'm a big believer that everything happens for a reason. And by you saying, yes, there was a reason you were there. And I think that's a classic wow. example of what can happen when you think it, believe it and do it. And you said something else offline that I want to go into to use as a segue. When you said that the Ukrainian people are at peace, and they are on a mission to win their land back, to, 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 to defend their land. And you use the phrase non-negotiable. It's non-negotiable. They're getting their land back. Yeah. I love that phrase because I see so many people in our industry, especially negotiating with their goals. Yeah. Start the year with this big goal and then, well, you know, maybe I'm not going to get there. And all of a sudden they're negotiating that goal down. What are your thoughts about that, Jamie? Because you've had a lot of success in the industry growing C3 super fast. Like what are your thoughts about how you're setting goals and the, the non-negotiables that are in your life? Talk about that for a second. Well, it's that word uh, that we both use now. I, I've come to understand, you know, people will say that you, when you speak, there's a level of confidence or this or that. It's, it's really peace. Like I'm okay with any outcome, good or bad. There, there's something to uh, salvage out of whatever the result is, whether you win a deal, lose a deal, whatever it is, um, there's something there to garner. You know, if you have that growth mindset, then you can be at peace with outcomes. And if you can be at peace with outcomes, then you don't have to compromise values, goals, objectives. You know, it's you, you just live with it, deal with it and adjust to whatever the outcome is. Um, and if you can get to that place where you genuinely 100% feel peaceful with whatever the outcome is, then you can be authentic to these things. Yeah, I think that's a key phrase. Peace, be at peace with the outcome. Because I know I'm guilty once in a while chasing to some finish line that doesn't exist. We all are. And you're so just so focused on trying to control the result. And that is the quickest path of frustration, stress, anxiety. And I, I find in those moments where I'm at peace with the result, no matter what happens, 
you just go about things with a, a calmness, a confidence that quite frankly, often leads to a successful result anyways. And so talk about that for a second. I know you have a lot of habits and rituals you deploy in your life. And I think this is where I see a lot of our peers struggle in this chase for revenue, for money, for growth. A lot of people are setting aside the other things that are going to make them healthy, happy, fulfilled. What are your beliefs? Like when you look at how you put together your days and weeks, what are some things you deploy in your everyday life to make sure you're operating on all cylinders? Yeah, I, well, first of all, at a very early age, I had a boss who got to the office at 430 and I just always had a mentality of, of being the first one there. So that required me to be there at 415. And I, what I found in those early mornings, uh, that gives me the space to create some peace because the things that I need to take care of, um, partly, which is rejuvenating my own battery and, you know, I'm an, a socially capable introvert. So I need that alone time as well. If I, if I don't have that early morning alone time, then I'm starting the day out with my battery already like half drained. But if I get that time in the morning, fully charged, the way I can attack the day is so much more um, productive. So I just starting the mornings that early and not every morning's a hundred percent the same, you know, I'm not like a, a, a Tony Robbins or somebody who's just so committed to an exact regimen, but I, I am up, you know, usually by 430 and there is some space, whether it's 30 to 45 minutes to myself um, before I, I will either then take care of some work items, you know, that uh, I always every single day will have one, two or three things that come hell or high water getting done that day. And I'm really, really good at extremely prioritizing those things and not allowing other things violate that. Um, it, you know, it'd take like an act of war for me to not get those two or three things that I decide in the morning I'm going to get done. Um, and I think that's really important. But at least three or four times a day, I think you're or week. I think you're alluding to the fact that, uh, you know, I'm a Wim Hof believer uh, in the meditation that he does, which is a lot of forced air uh, using high concentrations of oxygen uh, and then combined with cold water therapy. And I, I've I've been doing Wim Hof, like I would say cold showers, as cold as you can get a shower for probably 10 years or more. My kids do it. You know, we end all of our showers with maybe a minute or two minute or doing some uh, breath work. And uh in 2020, I remember I was just like feeling stressed, you know, like more stressed than like my workouts or whatever I was, you know, running and stuff was alleviating. I still felt a residual amount that I didn't feel resolved with. So I turned to uh, uh, Wim Hof and was like, I really want to buy a cold water tub and go to the next level. You know, in, in San Diego, you know, the cold water all by itself, the coldest gets probably 62 degrees or something. It's not that cold. And so, but a cold tub is six to 10 grand, you know, and I didn't want to just go invest six to 10 grand and not use it. So what I did was I, I convicted to every day in December's coldest San Diego water gets, I'd spend three minutes with a hose uh, at 430 in the morning and j just under the hose doing the Wim Hof breathing. And I was like, if I do this for 30 days straight, then I'll give myself permission to buy a cold tub. And so I did that. And you know, people, people just kind of, when you have a cold tub, it becomes something people talk about, like we are right now. And that has just morphed uh, literally the all-star baseball team I'm coaching. Uh, you know, the manager of that team was like, can we come do the cold water thing at your house? I'm like, hell yeah, we can. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll take a break there, but, um, and then we can talk more. Well, no, I like that. That's really what got me onto it with you. As I saw a post you had made when you were out, was that your back deck? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you guys are you're sitting with the team, the kids in a circle, and I think you guys were probably doing some breath work. We were um, before or after the cold the cold immersion. But I'll tell you, man that that has been a game changer for me. And I think I think the thing about breath work and or cold therapy is unfortunately it's become a fad a little bit where I think a lot of people are doing it without knowing why they're doing it. Right. Um, but I can tell you, you know, I start my day with a three minute cold shower. And I don't have a cold plunge yet. And then I actually end the day. The last thing I do before I go to bed 
is I get back in and I take another cold shower. And that one might only be a minute, minute and a half, but I will tell you, I have never slept better since I started doing a cold shower right before bed. I, I can't cite it like uh, my friend did, but uh, Nick Hardwick was the center and team captain of the Chargers for a long time. And he, one night he was telling me, oh, I got to go to my house. I, I take a, a, a hose, cold shower before I go to bed. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about, dude? And he's like, yeah, I, I go home. I go out back. I strip naked. And I, I put cold water on my head for three minutes before I go to bed. I'm like, why are you doing that? And he went through a sophisticated explanation of, you know, physiology and all this stuff, but essentially it comes down to you go into it's either deep or REM when your core temperature cools down. And so if you can start the process of cooling your external down before you get into bed, it seems counterintuitive because the cold water is provides energy uh, to some extent. But it really works to get you into that deep sleep state to where you're really your mental recovery is stronger and all that. And so, I mean, he's just explaining all this stuff to me. And I'm like, you've got to be nuts. And I've talked about it with brokers on my own team, you know, who were having stress and trauma. I'm like, why don't you try introducing this and see if it'll help you get better sleep? And the results are 100 percent of the time. Like what you said is the result everybody has. I've never heard otherwise. Yeah, I'd be curious your thoughts. So you started doing this, what you said, 2020? Yeah. You yeah. you have, I assume now saw, uh, since gone on and got a cold plunge, a tub. Yep, I got a legit uh, one. What, which one, what kind, of, what brand do you have? I'm curious. I have Renew Therapy. Okay. It's R-E-N-U Therapy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> with the breath work and the cold plunge, because I have a lot of advisors, I, I, I share these ideas with them. They go, oh, yeah. heck, no, I'm not going to do it. What results have you seen since making this a consistent practice, both the breath work and the, the cold therapy? Well, I, I'll be the first to admit, I never did breath work be, before December of 2020. And, uh, you know, I'm not good at doing yoga and meditation. I'm really not good at any of that. And so what I liked about uh, Wim Hof, if people are looking him up, Wim's just W I M. And then second word, HOF, he's a Dutch guy and his, his free breathing classes online. That's all I do. Um, and I do box breathing, you know, that the military teaches just for kind of stress management. And that's a big part of what I teach, uh, whoever comes to my house and we do it together. But, um, Wim Hof's breathing, I just, I don't even know what he calls it. I don't remember, but I call it forced air. You're taking big, deep breaths and blowing out really fast. And, and then you're doing breath holds. And it, it's crazy because when I first started doing it, I could hold my breath about a minute and a half. It's always a strong swimmer and all that stuff. And I got to five minutes and probably a month or so, you know, it, and I can't do it all the time. It's, it's all over the board. Sometimes two minutes, sometimes it's four minutes, you know, it kind of depends on how deep of a state of relaxation you get into. Um, but what I, what I've found that I think is powerful, there was a yoga class I was doing and this lady, she's, she's kind of coaching you, right? She's like, Hey, if, if your mind drifts off to these other things, it's okay. You know, like don't beat yourself up, just recognize it when it goes over there and gently bring it back and give yourself permission for that to happen because it's, it's natural. And that really helped me because when you're doing his forced air, 40 deep breaths takes about two and a half, three minutes. Then you're going into a breath hold that could be anywhere from two to five minutes. There's a lot of thoughts going on in your mind. So you do three cycles of that. The whole first cycle, I'm uneffing my mind, right? It's all over the place. And I just like, I'm like a little 12 year old boy just running around spastically in my mind. By the second, um, the second round of it, somewhere in there, you get that high on your own supply. You're, you're putting so much oxygen, you feel a little bit high and you just kind of feel your body settle. Uh, and by the third time you go through it, uh, after you finish each breath hold at the very end, you take one last breath for 15 counts and then let it go. And after the third time of his, of the breathing hold, and then that 15 seconds, your body feels purified. Like, I, I don't know another way to say it. it. You feel like whatever 
is negative in your body just got flushed out. Like that's the breathing side. Yeah, I would agree. I, I, when I look at my morning routine, you know, looking back, I've done it for probably about the same amount of time you have. And it's so consistent now, you probably don't see the results like you did at the beginning because it is part of your everyday life. But I, I do notice now, like, I don't freak out as much over stressful situations. Yeah. Um, I totally agree with your thought about once it's done, like you can wake up or you can start the, you know, the morning off on the bad foot. But by the time that cold therapy, the, the breath work is done, like you're locked in. One thing I started doing is actually incorporating or combining breath work with getting, uh, doing some sun gazing where you're looking at that morning sun as it comes up. Hmm. Cause I was listening to, uh, do you know, Dr. Huberman is. I do not. He's a scientist from Stanford. He's into the whole health and wellness. Andrew Huberman is his name. He's got one of the most well-known podcasts around, but he talks about the importance of looking at the morning sun before it's at its zenith where it hurts your eyes, where you can still look yeah. at it early because it actually kicks. What it does is it kicks off your circadian rhythm and it actually helps with sleep the next night. So I started doing the breath work with the sun gazing at the same time. And that's been a super big help. Interesting. Um, and again, yeah, I look at right. it this way. This is why I wanted to talk to you. I look at myself still like an athlete and I'm like, I'm going to do anything I can to give myself an advantage over the competition. These small little things off the field are what give you that advantage. Is there anything else you do, Jamie, outside of the breath work and the cold therapy to put your mind or your body in the right position to win the day? You know, um, I, I, I do kind of a combination of prayer and meditation, maybe, you know, um, I'm not the most religious person, but I, I take a lot of space to be with my own mind. And the, the place I do it is in the shower. I, I don't know what it is about it. Even if I do, uh, when I finish the cold tub, I'll still go up and uh, have that time in the shower. And there's something about the uh, effect of the water raining on you that opens my mind. Hmm. It, it's almost like, you know, when you have a couple of glasses of wine and it opens your mind and you're thinking creative thought, it, it's similar to that where I, something opens and different thoughts are able to come out that, that I don't in other settings. Um, hmm. But I mean, I, I, you know, I, I work out and I coach my kids a lot. And I think that uh, coaching is a really important space. Be, because it's just so easy, you know, like in our business, uh, in any business out there, it, it doesn't have boundaries anymore. You know, technologies has made all our professional lives without boundaries. Uh, so I love coaching because it's a forced break. You know, it's sort of like surfing. You know, when you're in the water surfing, you're 100 percent consumed doing nothing but that thinking about nothing but surfing. And it's pure. It's like a drug in that way. Coaching is kind of like that too. You put your phone away and for two, three hours, you're a hundred percent engaged there. So those little breaks like that in, in the day, even though it puts stress from a time perspective of how to get everything done, I think they're really healthy for your brain to stop thinking about insurance, you know, your trucking clients your construction clients, whatever it is, and just have some free space for your mind to truly recover and then I'll go back to it, you know, after I put the kids to bed. Yeah, I like that. I, uh, a buddy of mine runs these trips. He calls guys trips where you spend a weekend with a small group of guys. We just did one in uh, at the beginning of May where we went and helped a buddy who bought an old mill in North Carolina. He's restoring it. And we spent a couple of days or a day just helping him restore. And it was it was a forced pause, forced break, because I couldn't tell I couldn't check my cell phone. I couldn't check email. I couldn't do anything, but be present in the moment. Yep. And it's so helpful to force yourself to do that. Literally make it impossible to think about work. Yep. I, I love it. Whatever that space is, I think it's important for people to be able to find on a fairly regular basis. Yeah. Don't, don't wait until you're, you know, your postal to be like, Oh, I need to get out of here. You know, it's well, like chip it away at it daily. You know, And I, and I bring that up because I was guilty. I have a lot of peers I know are guilty of this. We are in an industry that again, a lot of people are on the chase to financial success and they're putting too many of the other things on the side burner or back burner to chase that financial success. 
here's the reality, man. Even if you hit the financial success, you're not going to be happy if, if nothing else in your life is working well. And that's, right. that's why this stuff is so important because I do believe it's overlooked in our industry. And it's something that more we have to focus on more. It's what can you do? What are you doing off the field to put yourself in the best position to win it? So what advice, Jamie, we'll kind of wrap up here. What advice would you give those young advisors that we have coming into the industry? This is a passion of mine because I see a lot of good young advisors come in and they leave a couple of years later, burnt out and dejected because no one really helped them. With what we've been talking about, if you have a newer advisor to the industry, what advice would you give him or her? when it comes to that work they should be putting in off the field? Well, I think, I think we get so focused on our own worlds. Our, our job is to understand other people's worlds and solve problems for them. You know, and so if, if we're focused on what's the result for me, what success look like for me, it, it's going to be a harder path there. Or when you get there to your point, when you find this success, you know, if all you're doing is selling insurance at a cheap price or whatever in commodity trading, you're going to have a book of business that's going to drive you nuts. and You're going to be stressed all the time. Um, if you can get out in the world and build real relationships and learn business matters, understand finance and be in an industry vertical where you truly understand the problems that those businesses are dealing with, insurance or not, and then become a resource to solve problems. You know, that's where you're going to build a good book of business. You're going to have real relationships. And when you get to the level that you want personally, it, it's going to feel better. It's going to be built in a way that's conducive of the lifestyle you want. Um, so I think patience is is just a big part of like, hey, let's slow down, you know, plan your work, work your plan, be OK with failure and understand it's going to take a little time if you're doing it the right way. It kind of goes back to how we started this. Be at peace with the outcome. Yep. If you put yep. in the right work day after day, you should be at peace with the outcome. And that's such a valid point because. I see a lot of people stressing over the result right now because they got sales goals, right? They got to validate whatever that is. And not, not enough people are sitting there knowing, you know what? I'm putting in the work. I know the result's going to come. I'm at peace with it. Um, if we could get more advisors in that position, I think we'd see more successful advisors. And so I, I love the fact that you said that. Well, if somebody is listening in, Jamie, and they're like, I want to hear more about this Ukraine story, or I love the mindset from which you bring to the industry. What would be the easiest way to reach out to you? Yeah, hit me up on LinkedIn. It's, uh, you know, my name's J-A-M-I-E. Oh, it's right there. It's right there, under your picture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, perfect. Hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm accessible. I'm on it all day long and uh, happy to connect with, with anybody out there to have conversation. Awesome. Hey, thank you. I want to thank you for your time. If you're listening in, I hope you got a lot out of today's show. I mean, it's, I wanted to have Jamie on because he's one of those guys up who's, who's got it going on up here that's helped he and Gay, his partner Gabe and, and the rest of the team at C3 uh, have tremendous success. It's been fun to watch their growth. So Jamie, thank you. And for everybody else who had uh, who tuned in, thank you for tuning in. And it is, it's about putting in the work off the field when no one's watching. It's not just about your knowledge, product or anything else. It's about the self-talk, what you're doing up here to put yourself in the best position to win. So be good, go out and get after it. And uh, we'll see you on the flip side.